Doctor, can we start now? Uh, okay. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, okay, Assalamualaikum. I will start first. Uh, Nazri, uh, where's, uh, Nazri, can you uh, help to record this session? Boleh, Doctor. Teruskan saja. Boleh. Okay. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, very good morning everyone. So, uh, welcome to a special lecture on machine learning recognition. This is part of uh, our faculty research day activity. My name is Nor Hisham and I will be speaking as your moderator. So, today you will be hearing a presentation from Dr. Ibrahim Abakar Targil Hashim. This is the second time yeah, Dr. Ibrahim giving talk in uh, our faculty. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your time and uh, willingness to be with us again. And today, uh, Dr. Ibrahim will be speaking to us on few things to know about machine learning for data science. So uh, before uh, we start, let me read some bio from Dr. Ibrahim. During four years at University of Malaya, Dr. Ibrahim served as a research assistant and developer for Big Data and Mobile Cloud Computing Research Center. Dr. Ibrahim has been working on Big Data and Machine Learning since 2013 serving as first author on four manuscripts that have been accepted for publication in the journals. Dr. Ibrahim is equipped with the necessary skills to analyze and develop machine learning applications that can assist institutions to better understand the information content within the data to make smarter decisions instantly. Dr. Ibrahim obtained professional certificate from Cisco, including CCNP, CCNA, and CCNA Security, and APMG Group, including Prince2 Foundation, Atil V3 Foundation, and Obashi Foundation. Claudia Hadoop for Data Analytics, Apache Spark, Apache Flume, Group data ingestion and also talent big data integration. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ibrahim, without further delay, let me invite uh, Dr. Ibrahim to deliver his lecture. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hisham, for this uh, uh, lovely introduction and uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, everyone who has joined this uh, uh, session. So yeah, this is my second uh, presentation. And uh, today the session is about uh, machine learning. Uh, so let me first uh, share my uh, presentation, uh, my slides, um, then uh, we'll start. Okay, uh, uh, is it clear the, the slide? Yeah, clear, Doctor. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, the topic uh, today of this uh, session is a few things to know about uh, machine learning for data science. As we know that uh, in uh, recent year, uh, data science and machine learning has become one of the core uh, topics that uh, everyone is talking about. So uh, let's go through uh, this uh, machine learning, the journey of machine learning and how machine learning can be uh, utilized in uh, data science. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, not only uh, participants from computer science uh, here today, I hope some 
uh, participants from uh, other field also joining this uh, session because uh, it is benefiting uh, everyone as uh, we know that now machine learning has, has uh, spread rapidly through not only computer science but in uh, other fields uh, also. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give uh, an overview of machine learning and uh, also the intuition behind uh, machine learning and what are the key points that we need to know about machine learning in order to uh, uh, conduct uh, a proper analysis. So, so let's start with uh, definition of data science for those who don't know this uh, term uh, because it's a new term. So data science is the science which uses computer science, uh, statistics and machine learning, uh, visualization and human uh, computer intent, uh, interactions to collect, clean, uh, integrate, analyze, visualize and interact with uh, data. So the definition is no different from the traditional definition we have in uh, data mining and uh, data analytics, but what makes it unique is the combination of those uh, different uh, areas where computer science, statistics, and machine learning uh, all comes together to form this uh, new uh, area. So uh, the purpose of this is to get inside data or we create uh, data products that can be uh, useful for uh, decision uh, making. So uh, if we look at the definition from, uh, you can say a visual uh, point of view, you can see that there are three core area. Uh, one is the domain expertise and computer science and uh, mathematics. The domain expertise is required to uh, really understand uh, the data and give a feedback about what problems that we have to uh, solve. Uh, computer science are more into programming where we uh, take uh, the algorithms that is uh, developed and implemented in a way that we can learn uh, from uh, the data. Uh, mathematics are more into uh, statistics. So these three uh, components has uh, joined together and form a definition of what we call now uh, data science. So, um, why it is important uh, currently uh, to care about this uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, analytics in general. Uh, uh, Gartner is one of the companies that produces a report every year. And one of uh, the uh, uh, result or predictions that I have came up uh, with is to uh, tell in every year the stream of innovations, how they are growing and what we will look at it in the future. So uh, if you look at uh, this graph, you can see the expectations and over time and the hives are more into machine learning. So machine learning is now at the core of uh, most of the technologies. And if you look at the density here, you can see we have uh, deep learning, we have machine learnings, and also we have artificial intelligence and auto machine learnings are all in the hypes. It has a high expectations in uh, the coming uh, years. So this shows that there is a high demand on this uh, uh, technology. And also it is uh, going to be a feature for most of the, the core technologies that we are developing. So the model has changed. Uh, the previous model that uh, everyone are familiar with is uh, only few companies are generating data and the rest are consuming this data. So it was a simple model and we don't have that much amount of data that we generate only uh, a handful of companies that produce such amount of data and we use those uh, data in, in a variety of ways. But the new model uh, is a bit uh, different. Uh, we all generate uh, data as we know, we have now social media and uh, we have some other platforms that we use to generate uh, a lot of uh, data. And we also consume that uh, 
huge amount of data that we generate. So this is the new model that we are dealing with. And that's what has uh, led to uh, big data. So the big data comes from this huge amount of data that we are generating uh, every day, uh, whether from social media uh, or any other platforms that we are interacting uh, with. So this has changed the way we look at uh, the analytics in general and how we uh, view our data uh, itself. So uh, a bit of uh, comparison between uh, a business intelligence, which uh, most of the uh, companies are using, uh, and what data science uh, looks like. So if you look at the graph here, uh, as we go into future, we are more toward uh, data science. And the value, it also increase as we are moving toward data science. So generally, uh, business intelligence is all about pass and has a low value compared to uh, data science, which is more on predicting the future and look at uh, the value that we get when we predict uh, uh, the future. So uh, just a, a small uh, comparison in a table, uh, if you can see here, we have uh, predictive analytics data mining, or we call it data science. So the names is just, uh, you can say, uh, interchangeable, but uh, data science has now become a very uh, common term that most uh, uh, people, they use. So uh, the type of techniques and the data that we have is, we look at optimization uh, most of the time. We do optimization, we look at the predictive uh, modeling forecastings and statistic uh, analysis or statistical analysis. The type of data we have is uh, either structured data or unstructured data, or maybe uh, semi-structured data. And normally we deal with huge amount of uh, data. So those, are un those unstructured data sometimes comes from emails uh, that we use, or we use, let's say, social media such as uh, Twitter, Facebooks and uh, uh, other platforms to generate these unstructured uh, data. We also, nowadays we have uh, data comes from hospitals, for example, uh, the images and so forth. So all these uh, data, we call it unstructured data and we have to deal with it. Uh, unlike previously, we only look at the structured data and we provide some sort of analysis on that. Uh, so this is the new, uh, uh, transitions that is uh, happening uh, nowadays and what it brought some sort of complexity to deal with such amount of data. Uh, the common question normally uh, we have is uh, what if or what is the optimal scenario for our business and so forth. So these are kind of questions that normally we ask when we deal with uh, uh, data science kind of uh, project. For business uh, intelligence, as I said, is more about uh, the past. And what we do, the techniques we use is just to look at uh, the standard ad hoc reporting dashboards or a lot, or we just get some query from uh, the data we have. And mostly we use structured data and uh, some sort of traditional uh, sources also we have uh, maybe uh, data that is in uh, Excel format or something like this. So it's it's a very basic and doesn't require that much uh, amount of uh, effort to put in to get the, the result. And the questions, as I said, is all about past, uh, especially when we deal with uh, business intelligence, like what happens the last uh, quarter and how many uh, did we sell, for example, if we are talking about the business. So you can see the differences now between uh, the business intelligence and the data science and how we can see the complexity as we are moving toward uh, data science. So uh, to solve uh, any problems in data science, uh, there are some algorithms that normally we apply and the different uh, type of algorithms that we have uh, depends on the kind of questions that we we, we ask. So let's say uh, if we are asking a questions of comparing uh, between two things, uh, let's say we want to know uh, the email that is coming in 
uh, whether it is spam or not spam. So this kind of uh, question is uh, a classification algorithm. And there are many classification uh, algorithms. I will highlight a few of them in uh, our uh, uh, session here, but there are a lot of uh, uh, classification algorithms that has been uh, developed uh, recently, and uh, you can just uh, make use of those uh, algorithms. Uh, we also have uh, what we call anomaly detection algorithms, and this is always comes when we are looking at the weird uh, things. Let's say uh, uh, the changes in the network performance and uh, we want to see whether there is uh, an issue uh, let's say uh, in terms of uh, uh, denial of service attacks or something happens to our network so the performance sometimes keep changing from time to time so this uh, could be uh, weird things that is happening to our network so we can do some analysis uh, based on the data we collect from the logs and we can identify uh, what is uh, what has happened Mostly it's something like outliers uh, that is happening within your data, something that divert your data from the normal uh, distribution. So that is uh, normally uh, detection algorithms. It is also common algorithms that we have, uh, uh, you can apply. When we deal with the numbers, like how much or how many, it's always uh, a regression uh, algorithms uh, because we are dealing with a real uh, value. So there are different type of uh, a regression algorithms also like uh, multiple linear regression or linear regressions or logistic uh, regressions. Uh, if we are asking questions, how is how is it organized? It's a cluster of algorithms. Later we'll talk about supervised kind of learning and unsupervised kind of learning. Uh, but for now, let's just look at the questions. If we are asking about how is this organized, means we are looking at the grouping uh, or segments of uh, things then we are clustering uh, our data so that's a uh, clustering algorithms and there are different clustering algorithms that is used and the last one is uh, what should i do next and that's the reinforcement learning it's also one of the popular uh, uh, techniques uh, being used especially in car drive self-driving cars and uh, gaming and all those uh, kind of uh, 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 area where it requires some reinforcement uh, learning. So if we see all these uh, algorithms, even the names has not uh, changed from the traditional uh, data mining uh, that we use. It is just the nature of the data has changed and we have to somehow tune and uh, enhance our algorithms to deal with such amount of data or such kind of data, the complexity of data that we are dealing with. So that is only the changes that is uh, happening now. A uh, few algorithms has been developed recently uh, as an improvement of these uh, algorithms, but uh, the terms is still uh, reserved and we still use those same terms, classification, clustering, regression, and reinforcement learning. Okay, so the biggest challenge as i said is the complexity of the data and when it comes to the topic of complexity we are talking about the noisy uh, within our data because when we get the data normally the data doesn't come in a form that we can easily uh, use for analytics we have to find somehow some ways to uh, to deal with the noisy and also sometimes our data doesn't comes as a complete we have to also deal with incomplete data and diverse and also the stream data that is also coming especially from uh, social social media we also have uh, analysis uh, uh, in terms of scalability the accuracy uh, real time and also advanced methods that we have to apply in our uh, uh, analysis to get a better result uh, representation of our uh, analysis or our result also it's one of the challenges that is uh, coming up in uh, data science so each component or each part of data science has its own challenge we have to uh, deal with it so uh, but the key here is uh, the feature engineering so the feature engineering is at the end of the day some of your machine learning projects definitely is going to uh, succeed or going to fail so 
Uh, so depends on how you select your features or the kind of features that you use. And uh, learning is learning can be easy, uh, especially if you have uh, many independent uh, features that has correlation or correlate with your class uh, label in classification. Uh, but if it is not that much correlated then you may have some uh, problems of getting uh, an accurate uh, result so that is one of the the challenges so you need to uh, somehow perform uh, some sort of feature engineering in order to improve and also check the correlations between those uh, attributes uh, especially between independent variables and dependent variables to get a, a better uh, an accurate uh, result so uh, I will not spend uh, much time on this, but this is the, basically what uh, we have as uh, as a life circle of uh, data analytics. So we have four types of analytics, uh, all part of uh, data science. Uh, one is the predictive analytics, and we have uh, predict, uh, prescriptive uh, analytics and we have descriptive analytics and diagnostic uh, diagnostic uh, analytics. Those uh, four types uh, of analytics depends on the type of questions we, we ask. So when we get uh, data, we have to ask questions of uh, what we want to do with this data. And that questions will lead to the type of analytics that we want to uh, conduct. And each uh, analytics has its own methods techniques to deal with. Uh, let's say a predictive analytics, the question is what is likely to happen? There are different uh, approach or techniques that we can apply in order to answer these uh, questions and so forth. So it goes from information, from, anal from analysis to information, so it goes back to analysis and so forth. So it's a circle. So the common framework that is mostly uh, adopted is um, starting from collecting uh, our data uh, either through uh, stream data that comes from internet or we use historical uh, data and once we get our data then we have to uh, clean the data so as i said the data doesn't come in a form that we can easily use it for analysis we have to uh, perform some sort of uh, cleaning, we deal with uh, missing values, reduction of the data. If we have too many uh, features, we have to reduce the number of features and so forth. Also, sometimes we pull data from different sources, especially uh, if the data doesn't uh, reside in uh, one source, we have to pull data from different databases. We also have to perform some sort of integration in order to uh, unify the data uh, for the analysis. Uh, then we perform uh, analysis. We use some machine learning uh, algorithms to conduct this analysis. Depends on the type of analysis that we uh, want to do. And the last, uh, the lastly, is a visualization. So once we get the visualization, visualization is uh, some uh, form of representing your result in a way that uh, people or the decision maker can understand. So we use a graph like histogram bar chart or scatter plot, uh, any type of uh, graph that represent your your result. And the last one is uh, alerting, alerting and then it goes again and again. So this is the general frameworks that is commonly used. And if you are familiar with data mining, you will see no much difference from uh, data mining. Okay, so there is something called algorithms for those who are not uh, really into computer science. Algorithms is a set of steps for a computer program to accomplish uh, a task. It means we write a step-by-step -step procedure in order to solve a particular problem. So let's say a mathematician uh, uh, written a formula and that formula has to be converted into algorithms. We have to drive uh, this formula into a language uh, uh, language that we can easily understand and it should be in a form of a step by steps. 
So that's how uh, algorithms, algorithms uh, looks like. Um, it's mostly used by programmer to, to, uh, to write the programs that are uh, uh, used, uh, used by uh, computers. So, so then uh, learning, learning, now we are moving into uh, machine learning. Uh, we'll start with learning. Uh, learning uh, is an acquisition of knowledge or skills uh, through study experience or being taught by uh, someone. This is what we know about learning as a humans. Uh, we learn through uh, uh, knowledge that uh, being transferred to us or skills that we uh, we possess or the experience or being uh, that someone uh, has taught us. The same thing machine also learns through experience by giving uh, the machine some sort of examples and machine will use that example to uh, learn from it and use that to uh, uh, answer the right questions or uh, provide the right answer to questions that is being asked to, uh, by uh, uh, machine. So, so the definition of machine the definition of machine learning, as uh, Samuel uh, defined this uh, machine uh, learning in 1959, is, is the field of computer science that gives computer the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Means the computer should be able to learn by itself without uh, a programmer program uh, what the computer must do step-by-step -step procedure. So this is a tra the traditional way is we write a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure and we ask program uh, the computer to follow the steps to get the answer. But with machine learning, the computer should be able to learn without being explicitly uh, programmed. So we only need machine learning because as a humans, we can make decisions sometimes. We can predict futures if we have uh, enough amount of data and not too complex data. We can just look at it and we can just make a judgment. And that judgment can be right sometimes and can be wrong sometimes. So with machine learning, because of the complexity of the data that we cannot deal with, machine learning should do that task for us. So we only use machine learning when we have too complex uh, data that we cannot deal with. Uh, some tasks are so complex that it's, uh, unpractical for us to really uh, deal with it. So we use uh, machine learning to perform this kind of uh, analysis for us. So we provide large amount of data to machine learning algorithms and let the algorithms work, work it out by exploring the data and searching for the model that will achieve <coughs> what is the analytics have set it out uh, to achieve. So that is uh, what uh, machine learning uh, is. So the differences is between the traditional programming and machine learning is the traditional model, we have data and we have the program. So the programmer will write the program and we feed the program uh, with the data to the computer and then we get the result. So the result is the output that we get from this uh, data plus the program. Let's say if we want to input uh, output one plus one, then we have to key in one plus one and the program we write, the result will come out as a two. With machine learning is different. We give data and we give the output, means we give the examples, the result that we already have, and the computer should come up with a program that every time we use, we get uh, a similar result or maybe a somehow close result to what we are expecting. So that is what machine learning must do. So we have the data and we have the output as an example, and then uh, the model that we develop, and then the program is the model that we have. And every time we use this program, we get the result. So this is the uh, machine learning and how it is different from the uh, traditional uh, programming that we, we, we do. So uh, if I have to break it down, uh, uh, this, the whole picture of uh, machine learning, there are three main components. 
One is the representation and evaluation and optimization. So the, the learning itself, as uh, we just talked about, it consists of the representation plus evaluation and optimization. Mm -hmm. And we keep on circling this over and over again until we have a desired uh, result. So the representation is the selection or the choices of the classifiers. Classifiers are the algorithms. When I said classifier, it means I'm referring to uh, the model that we, we, we develop. So either the model or the algorithms or machine learning algorithms that we use, so they call it uh, classifier. So the set of classifiers that uh, we have, and we use some sort of uh, hypothesis to 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 see which which one will uh, produce uh, a result so initially we have the selection of the classifiers as a representative or represent a repre representation of uh, the problems that we we want to solve and then we evaluate this. So the evaluation comes in a form of uh, objective functions or scoring, you can say, scoring function. And is needed to distinguish the good classifier from bad uh, ones. Because when we use in a representation a selection or set of uh, classifiers, we produce multiple results for each uh, classifier. And some may produce a good result and some may produce bad results. So we have to compare between them and that's in uh, evaluation stage. And, and the last one is uh, an optimization. An optimization is need, needed or required to search among the classifiers in the language for the highest scoring uh, one because you have to look at the optimal. You have the set of solutions, you have the objective functions that uh, drive this uh, scoring and shows all these different uh, results that you have for each classifier, then you have to use an optimization te techniques to select uh, an optimal uh, result that fit uh, the problems. So the choice of the optimization techniques is the key for the efficiency of the, 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 the learner. So those are the three things that normally we, we do uh, either representation, uh, evaluation, or optimizations in uh, in machine learning. So, so the fundamental or the main goal of machine learning is to generalize beyond the examples uh, in training set. When we use a training set as an example in classification, uh, we should be able to generalize it means Whenever we get a new data set, uh, our model should be able to uh, provide us with an accurate uh, result. Uh, so the most of uh, the mistakes that uh, those who do machine learning uh, algorithms, they only rely on their own data that they have, only the training uh, data they use, uh, maybe uh, at the time when they are performing that analysis. So whenever the result they get, uh, they believe that this result might be uh, accurate. Let's say you get 99 or 98% uh, uh, accurate. Uh, does it mean that if we get a data set uh, similar to data set you have, you will also get the same uh, result. So you have, to, you have to make sure that your algorithms, uh, not only uh, for that specific, training set you use, but it should be generalized to any examples because the model, as I said, will be used over and over again with, on, uh, with any new data that you are feeding uh, your uh, model with. So it should provide uh, a better result. So this is uh, what generalization uh, means when we have the machine learning algorithm. Uh, also, we need to consider uh, data and uh, sometimes if we just look at uh, the data itself, data itself is not enough. We have to look at uh, the pre-processing part, how we can clean the data, and uh, we make sure that the data is ready for analysis. So every learner must uh, embody some uh, knowledge or assumptions beyond the data that is just uh, given to us. 
So uh, very general as assumptions like uh, smoothness and similar examples, having uh, similar classes, uh, limited dependency or limited complexity are often enough to do very uh, well. And this is a large part of why machine learning has uh, been very successful. So we shouldn't ignore all this uh, part. Uh, one of the key criteria for also choosing the representation is uh, which kinds of knowledge are easily expressed in what. So this is the questions that we ask. If you ask the right questions, then uh, probably we'll get the right uh, answer. And when you ask the right questions, you have to apply a right model for or the right classifier for that uh, questions that you ask. So, so these uh, parts are al also important. The kind of questions you ask when you have your data, the kind of uh, uh, pre-processing stage that you have to uh, go through in order to have data that is uh, accurate uh, in uh, a quality that can be used for uh, analysis. So uh, the general pipeline of machine learning problem is we start with defining the problem. So what is the task we want to teach a computer to do? And that's questions that we ask. And then we need to collect the data. And the data we collect, uh, uh, if we are performing a classification uh, uh, kind of uh, analysis, then we have to split our data into training set and testing set. So the large amount of data will go into the training set and uh, a small amount of data will go into uh, test uh, set. So the more data you have for training set, the better result uh, you, you will get. Uh, design features, also as I said, feature engineering is the key. So what kind of features best describe uh, the data? Because when you get huge amount of data, sometimes uh, uh, you will be wondering uh, which features I have to select for this kind of analysis. And that's a lot of uh, uh, questions around this, especially for the beginners. They uh, will be wondering which one will be suitable. So there are different ways, different techniques you can use in order to eliminate some features uh, and use the right features for, for this analysis. The most important is you need to uh, uh, look at the correlation a high correlations between your dependent uh, variables and uh, independent, uh, between your dependent variable and independent variables. Uh, then uh, the next stage is the train the model. Uh, this train the model is we tune the parameters of an appropriate model on the training data set. So we use some uh, algorithms uh, with uh, tuning the parameters of these uh, algorithms will get the model uh, based on the training data that we use. And once we get the, the model, then we use a test uh, data set and we build a test model to evaluate the performance of the training set. So it's just like in the beginning, during the training set, uh, we don't really uh, uh, eliminate the independent variable and dependent var variable. We just give all as an example for machine to learn from the data. And in the testing, we have to remove the last, which is the, the, the dependent variable and let machines to now learn uh, from the examples that we have given previously to predict this uh, dependent variable. So that's how how it looks like. So machine learning has uh, three types. And for each types, there are multiple algorithms. Uh, one is, we call it the supervised learning. And this supervised learning is a guided based learning. Uh, means uh, we have labeled data as an example for the machine to learn from. So when we train our algorithms, we give our data set, which is the training set, plus an example. Example is the labeled uh, 
uh, data means this is the uh, the answer that we uh, we 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 have and the machine will learn from your answer and later if you give a data set without uh, the answer the machine will be able to predict the answer so that's the the label so it's a guided base means we need to train first and then later we predict using the examples that we have give to a uh, machine uh, unsupervised learning is unguided based there is no example uh, given to the machine and machine has to figure out by itself so we just give the data and we expect machine will come up with uh, patterns or results that we are unexpected so this is very common in uh, in clustering where we just want to group uh, number of uh, 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 data based on certain uh, attributes. So this grouping will just be done without giving examples to machines how to uh, group those uh, data. Uh, re reinforcement learning is based on uh, based on uh, reward and punishment. So uh, when you have uh, reinforcement uh, algorithms or learning, uh, you are trying to uh, reward the, the machine as it does the right thing and punish as it does the wrong, uh, the wrong thing. And this is very common in, uh, in uh, game-based kind of uh, applications like for example chess is one of the famous uh, uh, game that use reinforcement learning uh, self driving car also one of the famous and also now in google we have alphago is one of the applications of reinforcement learning that recently developed to uh, beat the famous uh, 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 go player so it is it is used nowadays in uh, in, uh, in 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 machine learning and uh, it is very uh, successful also and uh, one of the trend nowadays uh, uh, reinforcement learning so this is just what i have just talked about the supervised learning and uh, how we can use supervised learning it's a classification uh, based kind of uh, algorithm uh, so, as I said, we have a uh, learning model, which is the training set, and we have the test set. So the learning, tra uh, the learning or the training set, we learn a model using the training data set. And the test thing, we use the test, the model using unseen test data, means the data without the class level uh, or, or dependent uh, variable. So to check the accuracy of your result you have to get from the test result that you you got you have to take the number of the correct classification and you divide by the total number of the test cases that you have let's say if you have uh, 100 cases in your test uh, data then you need to look at the correct classification that the machine is able to accurately predict uh, and you divide by the total number of the cases the whole cases which is 100 you will get uh, the the result so it will show you uh, how much accurate your algorithms let's say 50 percent 70 percent or 80 percent or maybe 90 percent accuracy so the step is you have training you build the model which is the learning algorithms and then you use the testing uh, to test the model and then you get the accuracy to conform your uh, your model and so forth so with unsupervised uh, it's a type of machine learning that uh, used to draw uh, inference from data set uh, consisting of input data without labeled response means we don't have the uh, the labeled uh, response uh, column or we don't have dependent uh, variable for it so uh, so uh, yeah as I said is a clustering is one of the algorithms that is very common in this uh, 
and uh, un uh, unsupervised uh, learning approach. Uh, we have also uh, reinforcement learning. It's also, as I said, one uh, of the learning algorithms, and it's based on rewards uh, and, and success. So uh, it is also one of the common uh, algorithms, uh, learning algorithms that is used, especially in gaming and also control like uh, traffic systems and uh, self-driving cars and so forth. So uh, if we look at the applications or the algorithms of, of uh, machine learning, uh, when we look at unsupervised learning, we have a clustering. Clustering is group similar data into cluster, means we uh, have a data and we group them into a, a number of groups, depends on their similarities. Uh, we have association rule discovery, also it's part of uh, unsupervised learning, uh, which we use to find human uh, interpretable uh, patterns or associations. We have a sequential uh, pattern discovery also. It describes the sequence uh, dependency among different uh, events. And also we have unsupervised anomaly detection. Anomaly detections can be supervised uh, uh, learning also, but uh, it's an unsupervised learning. Uh, also we have uh, anomaly detection, especially when we are uh, looking at the uh, outliers within our data. So to detect anomaly in unlabeled uh, data under assumptions that the majority of the instances are normal. So something like in fraud detections, uh, network intrusion detections are very common uh, to use anomaly uh, detection techniques. For, for classification, uh, classification is the predict the class of new cases uh, based on the labeled uh, data or class uh, label that we have. And the common example of classification is, uh, is spam uh, filtering. Uh, we have uh, handwriting character recognitions. And uh, in medical, we use in uh, patient uh, diagnostic and TOFOS. So there are many examples of uh, implementing uh, classification on uh, various uh, applications in different uh, areas. Uh, regression is dealing with numeric value of new cases. So it's a uh, very common in business also, especially when it comes to sales and uh, marketing, they use uh, regressions uh, more often. Uh, blood pressure also, uh, and weight and all these different uh, kind of uh, uh, applications that require uh, sort of uh, regressions uh, techniques to predict uh, the real uh, value. Uh, we also have the supervised anomaly detection. Uh, this is commonly uh, used when we identify items or events or observations uh, diverting from the expected uh, patterns using uh, the data label. So if in the case of having a label your anomaly can be uh, uh, supervised. Uh, anomaly detection techniques can be a supervised kind of uh, anomaly detection, but if you don't have a label, then it is unsupervised uh, learning. So uh, sometimes in some cases, you may need to apply uh, unsupervised and supervised, uh, let's say, uh, if you want to perform some analysis that require classification, but uh, during pre-processing, you realize that you may have uh, some data that diverting uh, from uh, the rest of your data, the variance is very high. So to identify that, you may apply some clustering techniques to find the outliers within your data. So. One of the ways to identify outliers, you can use clustering. Uh, so when you use clustering, it will show you uh, which data is diverting from the rest and you can remove those uh, data. So, so then you have to perform unsupervised learning with, based on clustering first, and then you move into uh, supervised learning, which is uh, clustering. So this is a hybrid uh, model or hybrid methods that you 
may need to uh, apply some uh, sometimes in your your data so the issue regarding classification and uh, prediction is more into uh, uh, predictive accuracy and this is uh, very uh, common if you have a less accuracy your data might not be reliable you have to improve uh, the accuracy of your result uh, speed and scalability time is one of the, the challenge also especially when you deal with huge amount of uh, data and uh, robustness of your model uh, especially when you have uh, handling noisy and missing values you have to find ways to uh, deal with these uh, uh, two challenges uh, scalability and uh, uh, the goodness of the the rules uh, especially if you are applying a decision tree uh, you need to look at the how good it is your uh, rules that you generate from the tree in order to uh, to get a better uh, accuracy so uh, I, I, I will go through three examples uh, i just randomly pick uh, three uh, matured algorithms that is commonly uh, used in uh, classification uh, and one of them is the they call it naive base so base classifier is one of the mature techniques that has been used for a long time and up until now uh, uh, many uh, companies researchers are using these uh, techniques because of its uh, simplicity and it is easy to uh, to apply in your your data so the basic rule of this uh, Bayesian is if you have two events uh, you may check or predict uh, what will happen based on what has already uh, given so let's say you have y and x uh, the formula say the probability it's a probabilistic uh, based uh, techniques the probability of one event uh, given the other event is showing in this uh, uh, formula which is based on the likelihood and prior and then the normalization uh, constants that is given so the probability of the event y given uh, a set of events let's say x1 x2 uh, until xn equal to the probability of the set of events that is already occurred which is x1 uh, all the way to xn depends on the number of events you have given the probability of y that we want to uh, predict or the events that we want to predict multiplied by the probability of y which is the prior divided by the probability of uh, the uh, the events that we already have which is x1 to xn uh, they call it the normalization uh, conditions so this formula it's very uh, common and it is up until now being used uh, as base, uh, base uh, rule it's uh, it's uh, uh, written long time ago by uh, by uh, by a famous um, uh, mathematician. Uh, it is uh, Bayesian uh, Surium. So up until now, we use in uh, in in machine learning, and the way we apply. Uh, let me just walk you through the intuition of how it, it looks like and how this uh, can be applied as an example. Uh, let's say we have a data set and this data set consists of two columns uh, sorry consists of three columns uh, we have the salary column we have the age column and we have the last column uh, we can call it a target uh, value uh, ta sorry target variable so the salary column and the age column are the independent variable the target variable which is either drive or walks are the is the target variable or dependent variable so what we want to do now we use this uh, data as an example to predict if a new uh, person comes to particular company with uh, 
certain age and the salary, we want to know whether this, this person will drive to the company or walk to the company. So in order to do this uh, kind of prediction, we need to learn from our data set. So we have the green, which is the number of people or the number of uh, the observations of those who drive to the companies. And the red one is the number of the people who walk to the company, uh, walk to the company. So the, the gray one is the new data points, means the new observations. Someone comes with a, a, a salary, an age. We know his salary and we know his age. We want to know whether this person most likely will uh, drive or will walk. So, so what we want to uh, do first, we need to calculate the posterior probability, the likelihood and the prior probability. So for both for drive and also for walks, and then we can compare to see this person uh, will be belongs to the green or will be belongs to the red. So to calculate the posterior probability, uh, sorry, the, the, the likelihood and prior probability and the marginal likelihood, we have to go back to our data set that is already uh, given. So the formula is the probability of the person walks given any events, the salary, the age, uh, equal the probability of X given uh, the events, which is walks, multiplied by the probability of walks divided by uh, X, which is the marginal likelihood. So, so now for the drive also the same, we uh, also calculate the probability for drives uh, given uh, the X. And then we compare between these two uh, uh, probability result. And the one with the high probability, then we can say that most likely the person will uh, drive uh, uh, or walk to uh, the company. So this is how we will get later and we compare. So all this will be done later by machine learning uh, uh, algorithms when we uh, apply it to our data, but it's just the intuition behind uh, what we will uh, expect. So, so the probability of works is the number of the works divided by the total number of observations. So the total number of observations are 30, which is the green and the red. The total is 30. And the number of the works is only the red one. So if we count the number of red, we will get it 10. This will give us the probability of work. The probability of the work is 10 divided by uh, 30, which is uh, 1 by uh, 30, 1 by 3. And again, we need to calculate the probability of uh, the marginal likelihood, which is the probability of x. Uh, the probability of x is the number of the similar observations among those who works divided by the total number of the works. So let's say we we just randomly we draw a circle and this circle shows those people who are close to our data points a similar they have a similar observation so let's say three from the red and one from the green so this is a random you can increase the number of uh, the similarities means it can go more uh, the circle can grow can be bigger but let's say we have this uh, circle which consists of three walks and one uh, green. So it means the probability of X given uh, the walks only, the walk only is three divided by 10, means three, which is similar to what uh, we want to predict, divided by the total, which is 10, so three by 10. This is the probability of X given uh, the walks. So now the probability of X is the number of the similar observations, all similar ob observations, including the green and also the red, which is four. We are not counting the one we want to predict, the gray one, only the, the drive and the walk one. Means we have three from here and we have one for, from here. So which is four divided by the total number of observations, which is uh, 30. So now we have all the informations and we just need to plug into our formula and we get the result. 
So we have now the probability of walks given uh, these events uh, is three by uh, 10 multiplied by 10 uh, divided by 30 uh, divided by four uh, divided by 30. So this will give us 0 0.75. So this is just the, what we already uh, have, what we already calculated and we just apply on the formula that we have uh, this one. Probability of X given walks multiplied by the probability by uh, of walk, walks divided by the probability of X. So this is the result that we get, which is 0 0.75. And we apply the same on the drive also. Means we need to calculate, we need to calculate uh, the same thing for the drive, which is the probability of X given drives multiplied by probability of drives divided by probability of X. So we need to calculate this again, and we will get the result. So now we have two uh, probability. Probability of work is 0 0.75 and probability of drives is 0 0.25. So by looking at these two values, we can say that the person who, is, who will most likely uh, works to the company because the probability is 0 0.75, almost 70% chance of this person uh, works. Probably maybe the salary is, uh, uh, is less and maybe still young, uh, doesn't have that uh, uh, experience or maybe doesn't uh, yeah, have that enough money to buy a car. So this is how we, we calculate. So if we look at the implementation, I'm using R as an example. Uh, in R, there is a package called uh, E1071. We need to install this package and we need to load the library. So if you are familiar with R, uh, you can get this package. You then uh, you load the library of the package. Then we need to build, this is the classifier. So remember we, in, in classification, we have to train our model first using training set. And then for prediction, we use test, uh, test set to evaluate the model that we develop. So we need to call, uh, this is the variable classifier. We need to call a function called naive base. So this function is already built in to this uh, library that we have. Uh, we just need to call the function. And these are the parameters that we need to pass. The parameters is we have X and we have Y. The X is your training set. When we put, when we add the training set, we just need to remove the last column, which is the dependent variable. And in, in Y, we put a training set of the independent uh, variable. So when we use a dollar sign means training set of the dependent variable. Let's say, uh, as I said, in the, in this example, we have, uh, we have age, salary, uh, independent variable, and we have the last column, which is the target variable, which represent works and drives. So this is our class level. So your class level will be uh, will be here. And this is your age and your salary, the variables. Uh, so we just need to remove the last one because you only have one class level. In any data set, you only have one class level. So you just have to remove that one. And you just need to put it here. So this is how you uh, build your classifier. And now, once you build the classifier, then you need to uh, uh, predict so we use y pred as a variable and the function we call is a predict. This function also, it's part of the package. We use a predict and the parameter we have here, we have classifier, the one which is already built. Uh, we already built the classifier using uh, this uh, line of uh, uh, code. And the new data is the data that comes from your data set. Uh, sorry, from your test set. And 
means we are feeding our classifier with a test data without dependent variable. So we just need to remove the last one because this is what we want machine to predict. So when we remove the dependent variable, machine should be able to predict this uh, last column. Unlike here, we are giving both. We are giving the dependent variable and independent variable because uh, the classifier has to learn from the example that we are giving. But in this here, we are not giving this. And this is how we evaluate to see whether the machine is able to predict it accurately or not. So this is the training set and this is the testing set. And this is when you build the model and this is when you test your, your model. Then you can use uh, uh, any uh, matrix to check uh, the result. You can use, let's say, confusion matrix, for example, to see uh, the, accu the, the accuracy of your result, which one is the correct prediction, which one is the wrong prediction, and so forth in total. So this is a simple way of implementing the base in R, and it's very simple. You don't have to write a lot of codes. You just need to call the function, which is the naive base from this package, from this library, and then you just uh, apply on your, your data set. But you have to make sure your data set is ready for analysis. After you clean the data, means you deal with the missing values, uh, data reductions, the variables, you have to also make sure your data is consistent. You have to have a discrete values. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have your data in a text, you have to encode them. Uh, uh, you have to encode them. Uh, you convert them into values and so forth. So you have to have your data ready. Then you move into uh, this part and apply an algorithms on, on it. So uh, decision tree also, one of the mature uh, algorithms used in uh, in uh, machine learning uh, it is a flow chart like structure or like tree structure so it goes from uh, the root all the way to uh, the leaf so the way it works is we break down our features or our uh, variables into uh, multiple trees until we reach to the last uh, leaf node which is your class level so we have the internal node the internal node represent your outcome uh, of the test so every time we test we produce a new branch and this branch will be test until you get the final uh, uh, class level what we are looking for is the class level but to reach this class level we have to check let's say if a is less than uh, uh, 575 then you go then you check so the condition you check is yes it's less then you move into the next and then you check b equal to then you check and then you move uh, further until you have the last uh, one which is the leaf so it depends on uh, which one you are checking it will lead you to type of class level that you want to uh, look uh, for. So the leaf node is representing the class level or class uh, distribution. And the first is internal node test, and then you have the branch, which is the outcome of each test. So it, the branch can grow into bigger branches until you have the last, or it can be very small, depends on the number of the attributes that you have. But with decision tree, you have to be very careful with uh, the selection of the features, which one must be started first and, and so forth. There are some techniques they use in this, uh, they use information gain to, uh, to, to check each and every features and to, to see which one has to be uh, start with. So it's based on the, the ontography uh, based. So uh, when it comes to decision tree, as I said, it consists of two phases, uh, the tree constructions and the tree uh, pruning. The tree construction is that all the training examples are at the root, and then you start partitioning uh, them recursively based on the selected attributes. The tree pruning is we identify and remove the branches because some branches 
may lead to uh, overfitting. So we need to identify those uh, branches and we have to uh, remove them because it could be an outlier or something like this. So tree pruning is uh, very important. It uh, increase the accuracy of your result. So when we have overfitting, which is very common in decision tree, uh, we look at it as the bug in your data. So when you are learning out, uh, outputs, uh, a classifier that is 100% accurate on the training uh, data, but only 50% uh, uh, accurate on the test data, when in fact it could have output one that is only 70% uh, accurate or both, then we look at it as uh, uh, what we call uh, overfit. So you need to be very careful. So in machine learning, uh, overfitting is uh, it's, it's one of the uh, problems that can uh, reduce the accuracy of uh, your re result, either based on the bias or the variance. So once we build the decision tree, then we have to use the decision tree. So decision tree is just a rule based means we, uh, we extract a set of rules based on the tree that we create. And uh, we use these uh, rules to uh, accurately uh, predict or classify that uh, new class level. So the way to avoid overfitting in classification, generally, especially in decision tree, uh, uh, if we have too many branches, uh, some of them may be noisy uh, or outliers, so we need to remove those. So this could result on poor accuracy, and the way to deal with is we either use a pre-proning or post-proning. Uh, uh, in pre-proning, uh, the tree construction uh, we held the tree construction early and we do not split the knot if this will lead to the uh, overfitting. Uh, and it is based on the threshold. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to choose a threshold, and based on the threshold, then we have to uh, start splitting uh, the tree. But sometimes it's very uh, difficult to choose uh, an appropriate uh, threshold for your, uh, uh, your splitting. The post pruning is we remove the branch from the fully grown tree, get uh, to get the sequence of the progressively prone uh, tree. So it depends on which techniques or which approach you use. Uh, it uh, may reduce or eliminate overfitting within uh, your data. So in decision tree, also the simplest, the easiest way to implement in R is we can use a library uh, called uh, RPART. So you need to install this uh, library first in R, they call it RPART. And to build the classifier, we need to call the function RPART. And we use uh, two parameters. One is the formula and the second one is the data. In a formula, we give all the dependent variables. So this formula is your decision tree formula that we, we use. It's just uh, implemented and we just call uh, the library, uh, the function. And in the function, it has the, uh, the formula. And what we just need to do is we just need to uh, in, uh, input all the dependent variable. Uh, so this uh, uh, sample is, is all your all dependent variables, uh, uh, so, so your dependent variables and, and all dependent variables that you have. And for which data is for the training set? Means we need to put the dependent variable and every data we have all the uh, independent, uh, independent uh, variables that uh, we have all together. Uh, in the formula and it will produce the result. So once we build the classifier, then we uh, also predict. So we use a white pred variable uh, equal predict is the function. And in this, uh, 
we call the classifier that we built and we use a new data which is the test data set we have and in this case here we remove the dependent variable in here we put the dependent variable plus all the independent variable but in test set when we predict we have to remove the dependent variable because that's what machine learning uh, decision tree must uh, predict and the type class is to show the result in a form of uh, binary which is zero and, and one so this is uh, the simplest uh, way to implement decision tree in r and as i said before this you have to perform some pre-processing if it's required then you need to build the model or the decision tree uh, model and then you can uh, plot the graph uh, data after you build the models but this is uh, specifically focus on how to build a decision tree uh, model. So uh, there is also a, a very uh, mature algorithms. We call it a K nearest uh, neighbor. The K nearest neighbor algorithm is the method for classifying objects based on the closeness uh, training examples. So it is more on the similarities. So we need to measure the similarity between uh, different data points and we classify them based on that. So it is purely based on uh, uh, similarity measure and we use a distance function as uh, uh, a formula to calculate the distance or the, the similarities between uh, different uh, data points. There are different names. Uh, sometimes you can find it in a textbook. Sometimes we use k nearest neighbor, which is the very common uh, names. We have a memory-based uh, reasoning, example-based reasoning, uh, an instance-based learning, and so forth. So these are different uh, names, but the common one is they call it the k uh, and n, k nearest neighbor. So. Uh, to calculate the distance, there are different uh, distance functions. And the common one we use is uh, Euclidean distance function. It's a differences between uh, x's and uh, y's uh, uh, square. Uh, we also have uh, Manhattan's and Minko whiskey uh, uh, distance uh, functions. So these are different, uh, these are the different distance uh, functions that we use to calculate the similarity between uh, uh, different uh, data points to uh, to classify them. So let's look at example of this uh, uh, KNN algorithms. Let's say we have uh, data with two categories. Here we have X1 and X2. And we have, this is the class label, which is category one and category two. So this is before we apply KNN and when we apply the KNN, we should be able to classify these new data points into whether it belongs to the category one or category two. So the final result after we use KNN should be something like this, means it's a red. So the new data points is categorized or predicted to be a red rather than a green. So, so in order to do this, let's follow the steps of uh, the algorithms. First, we need to choose the number of k neighbor. Means our data points, how many neighbors are close to these data points? We need to first identify. It can be random, you can just randomly say, for example, two or three or four or five. Uh, then we take the k nearest neighbor of the new data points based on the Euclidean distance. Means we use Euclidean distance to measure the distance. And then among those k neighbor, we count the number of data points of each category. Let's say uh, you have the green and you have the red. And when we measure the data points, we found out that uh, our data point is close to green because we have three from green and two from the red. Then we can put that uh, new data points with the green because uh, there are three and here is two. Let's say if the neighbor is five, three from green and two from red, then it will go with the 
green because green are outnumbered the red. So once we assign, then uh, we keep on re-change uh, the, the points and we calculate again until we have the final uh, result. So we assign the new data points to the category where the count the most and that's it. So the model will be ready. So this is the step we, we follow to perform this. So let's look at this data point. So the first thing we need to check how many number of K we want. Uh, let's say we choose a five uh, neighbor. So we randomly, we draw the circle or we calculate the distance to see from the green and from the red, how many are close to the new data points. So, uh, so the way to calculate, we use uh, we use Euclidean distance. The Euclidean distance is the functions of looking at the differences between two points. Uh, sorry, the, the sum up of the two uh, two points. But we look at the differences between x's and y's. So x two minus x one is squared plus y two uh, minus y one is squared for each uh, data points. And then we, uh, we, we categorize the data points based on the number of the data points, uh, which is close to our data points. So based on the calculation, uh, here we can see that there are three red uh, data points, which is close to our data points, and two from here, which is close to our data points, then this uh, data points, the new data points will be belongs to the category one, which will be uh, the red one. So if we change the number of K, let's say if we change the number of K to three, probably this new data points may fall into this category, which is category two. But at the end of the day, it depends on uh, the distance that we calculate. This distance here is just in graph, but the way it works is based on the similarities. Let's say you have age uh, 25 and 23 are closer compared to 25 and uh, 15. So it means uh, that's how uh, the algorithms will look at it. It will calculate and it looks at the closest uh, based on the similarities. and and it groups them uh, based on that. So, so how do we select, uh, how do we choose the, the K? How do we decide on the K uh, value? Because now we just randomly say five closest. So the K should be large so that the error rate is minimized. But if the K is too large, we leads to over a smooth boundary because uh, uh, it is uh, too large. Uh, also, the K should be small enough so that only uh, nearby the samples are included. But if the K is too uh, is small, it leads to the noisy uh, decision. So these are the common uh, issues with the K, uh, KNN. Uh, if we choose the number, uh, too big means the k too big it might lead to over smooth if we choose the number is too small let's say one or maybe two it may create the issue of uh, the noisy and may not lead to the better decision so the best way of to get this result of the number of k then we can just apply k is the square root of n n is the number of the observations that you have so this might give an optimal number of K that we can use, depends on the size of the data that uh, we have. So historically, the optimal K for the most data set have been between three to 10. If you don't want to apply these techniques, then you can just uh, uh, select between three to 10. Most likely uh, it is uh, optimal number of K. Uh, so let's say you choose five. If you didn't get the desired result, then you can just change to six and seven and eight. And you just keep on uh, uh, going back and forth between this number until you find an accurate result that you are looking for. 
So it's not one time, it's an iterative base. You have to do it multiple times in order to have that uh, desired uh, result. So also when it comes to implementation of KNN in R, it's very simple also. Uh, this library class is already uh, in R. You don't have to install the library. It's already there, so you just have to load the library called class. And the way you uh, build the model here, it's a bit different from uh, the previous uh, decision tree and an A base. Here, we give the dependent and independent uh, variables and the machine will be able to predict, but we have to decide on the number of K. The number of K is already given. So the train is the training set. And in the training set, we remove the dependent variable. For the test set, for the test set also, now uh, we remove the dependent variable because we want to calculate the distance between uh, between them. And uh, the class here, we take the training set and we input all the attributes, the dependent and independent uh, variables. So the machine, uh, the KNN will use the example and it will calculate the, the distance of each one of them based on the example or the examples that we have uh, provided and it will provide the result for the test set. The number of K we decide upon is five, which probably may be the optimal number of uh, K that we, uh, we select. So this will give you uh, the predicted uh, value or the predicted uh, result of that class level that we want to predict. We are just giving both the training set and the test set. And we are also providing all the attributes uh, of the training set. And then the calculation will be taken uh, based on uh, the Euclidean distance function. And then uh, it produces the, the predicted uh, result for the test uh, data set. So, so now, after all this, uh, model development, the most important part is how we uh, evaluate the performance of the model because that's the, the, the crucial part of it. You develop the model. If the model doesn't provide a better uh, accuracy or better result, then that model might not be uh, used or might not be good. So we have to find ways to uh, find ways to uh, improve the performance of the model. And in most of the research that we do, we look at the existing research work, we see uh, the accuracy that they have achieved, and we enhance their accuracy, uh, whether we look at the data uh, again and we enhance the quality of the data by uh, working on the feature engineering, or we can uh, enhance the model itself by tuning the parameters, and come up with an algorithms or a way that can give us a better performance compared to the existing uh, performance. So the measurement criteria sometimes is based, these are just some examples, but there are many uh, uh, measurement criteria that we use. So accuracy is the most common uh, in classification. Uh, the accuracy uh, is the overall uh, how often the classifiers is correct. So we look at uh, how many classes that we are able to get it uh, correctly. Uh, uh, the pre uh, precision and recall is also part of the classification. Uh, we use it uh, very common, uh, but when we use uh, precision and recall, we only look at the uh, from the precision perspective, we look at the ability of the classification model to retain only the relevant uh, uh, instance. But for the recall, we look at the classification model to identify all the relevant uh, instance. So we are, let's say, we are only looking at the, the positive uh, result. So we don't have to look at the negative result. So we just only calculate the performance or the accuracy of 
how accurate is a uh, it is from uh, from uh, what we call uh, from the the positive uh, uh, result uh, or the label that we we get uh, a square error also is very uh, common especially in uh, regressions uh, information again as i said we use in uh, decision tree and we have the area under the curve it's also uh, the common uh, uh, techniques uh, used uh, as a matrix to evaluate the performance which uh, summarize the performance of the classifier and overall the the, the possible uh, threshold we also have the cross uh, validation is very common also this is uh, especially if you want to ensure uh, your model is performing well by having multiple uh, subset of your uh, data that uh, will be uh, evaluated in a form of uh, iterations so this just to ensure that the result uh, the accuracy or uh, whatever performance uh, that you want to achieve it's uh, acceptable uh, so it is uh, it is very also common use uh, cross validation so these are some of the techniques uh, used to evaluate the performance of your uh, your machine learning algorithms so it's not only one algorithms most of the time we apply in our data we may apply multiple algorithms uh, so these are the hypotheses and then we have to uh, evaluate the performance of each one of them and then we select the one which is more optimal to us the one which produce a better uh, result uh, for us so yeah that's uh, that's all for this uh, session today uh, so if you have any question please uh, feel free to uh, ask me okay um thank you very much dr ibrahim for your uh, presentation um let me summarize first uh, before we proceed to the question and answer session Okay, um, first, uh, Dr. Ibrahim talked about uh, the types of machine learning classification. Okay, so the different problem will, uh, will, will use a different type of uh, machine learning. Uh, for example, we can use classification, uh, anomaly detection, uh, regression, the clustering, as well as the reinforcement learning. And also, uh, before the data can be the second thing is before the before the data can be useful, it should be prepared, analyzed, and also we can display it. And Dr. Ibrahim also talked about feature engineering, the term of uh, predictive and pre pre prescriptive analytics. Yeah, Doctor. And Data analytic frameworks, there are five stages in data analytic frameworks, that is collection, the data collection, uh, and then we have to click to pre-process the data, and then we do some uh, integration, analyze, visualize, and then finally we alert. And also Dr. Ibrahim uh, talked the basic um, term about the algorithm, uh, what it basically is learning, the different of machine learning and uh, traditional learning technique. Okay, the difference between uh, uh, traditional programming and the machine learning technique, as well as the, uh, the learning process, the pipeline of, of machine learning. First, we need to collect the problem to identify the problem, to collect the data, and then we have to design the features before we can train uh, and test the data. And we also have uh, uh, three types of machine learning, we call it supervised, uh, unsupervised machine learning, and reinforcement learning for prediction. And then uh, next, Dr. Ibrahim have talked about the, the issues of uh, Classification. So there are F issues in uh, classification. 
and uh, Dr. Ibrahim also give a few examples uh, by using NEF base, decision tree, can and end. And the last one, uh, Dr. Ibrahim um, talked about uh, how to evaluate the model uh, performance. So uh, now uh, I want to open for any uh, question uh, from our participants. Any question from uh, participants? Okay, there is a question from uh, Jing Zi. What is the appropriate performance evaluation for classification tasks on an uneven distributed data set? And how we tackle uneven distributed data set problem? Um, uh, actually, the performance of uh, the performance of uh, an event distributed uh, data set uh, is no different from the existing uh, evaluation criteria, but uh, it it goes back to your uh, it goes back to your uh, your your data set itself. Uh, uh, it doesn't affect uh, how you apply. A particular evaluation criteria on it. It's just uh, the result you may get may vary depends on uh, the kind of uh, data set that you have in your uh, an event distributed. I think. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, there is a question from Encik Zakaria. In stock market prediction, there are peak and throw set points. Is that outliers or can be a process? Uh, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily to be a, a peak uh, means not necessarily to be an outlier. It can be a process, but uh, uh, you need to once you get once you get it. That's why we have the domain expertise. The domain expertise might tell you whether it is uh, outlier or not, but you need to identify it first. So, if as an analyst, we don't really uh, care much about uh, uh, whether it is uh, outlier or process. But the decision makers will be able to tell us uh, whether this is uh, outliers or process. But let's say during the processing in the early stage, you want to conduct an analysis, and you have uh, one data one, one data points diverted far, for example, from the rest. Uh, then uh, you may consider this as. Uh, an outlier, but the outlier not necessarily to be a bad outlier. Always uh, means uh, it is just the change on an events that occur during a certain period of time that doesn't uh, fall within the range or the standard uh, ways of uh, how the data flow. So that changes might tells you something. Uh, so it could be due to. Uh, uh, some uh, events occur on that period of time, so you need to know now. Uh, so, if you are, let's say, if you if you are doing anomaly detection, you can consider this as an outlier. But let's say if you want to do analysis on the rest of the data set, and that might affect the overall performance, then you need to remove that. Uh, uh, you need to remove the, that outlier from the data. So, even though you know it is a process, it's part of the normal events. But still, you have to remove it because it will uh, impact. Unless you have too many, then it will not be an outlier. So you can just uh, check. OK, 
Okay, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so, any other question? From Muhammad Bilal, it is necessary to scale or normalize target data with skew distribution, for example, salary. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it, is, it is important. Uh, it is in data analytics, it's important to normalize or scale your, uh, your, your, your data. Uh, that not, it's not going to impact your result, but rather it is going to uh, somehow uh, present your result in a way that can be clear and can be seen when you uh, plot them in a graph. But if you didn't scale your salary and you have, let's say, uh, data points with uh, small values, then uh, it might impact, but not always necessarily that you have to scale them. But if you scale them, in, especially in classification kind of uh, analysis, it would be good. It would, it would be good. But it is not going to impact your, uh, your, your data itself. Your salary will not be changed. It's just the scaling only. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other question? Okay, uh, doctor, I have uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, regarding one of the problem um, in classification uh, accuracy yes. that might uh, uh, caused by the unreliable data. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, when we collect our own data, uh, how we want to ensure that uh, the data is not um, overfitting or underfitting problem? Okay, uh, yeah, when it comes to the overfitting, you need to check uh, two things. Uh, you need to check uh, the variance. It means you need to uh, uh, eliminate uh, if you have variance. And also, you need to check the the bias. The bias. So these are two uh, things that cause uh, our, uh, overfitting or underfittings uh, in your data. So, so by understanding this, uh, and if you decomposing uh, co the generalization error into these two then you will be able to uh, eliminate this uh, issue of the overfitting uh, or underfittings. Because uh, these are the common uh, problems that we have, especially uh, when we have the data that is uh, unbalanced, you know, uh, we need to make sure it's consistent uh, and doesn't fall uh, under this uh, overfitting uh, issues or underfitting uh, issues. So bias sometimes is a core of this challenge. You need to uh, find ways to uh, eliminate and the variance also within your, your data. Okay. Um, there is a question from Dr. Evin. Uh, there is so many types of data available today. So what advice do you have on selecting the most challenging approach? Do you have a step-by-step -step guidance on this, or do you base your selection of machine learning on the state of the arts apply on the problem that we are working on? Um, the, actually, the, when it comes to selection, it's, it's just like a hypothesis. Uh, uh, it's hard to exactly decide on what kind of algorithms that I have to use, but, uh, but there are some uh, indications uh, in any data sets. Let's say some algorithms works very well with huge amount of data and some algorithms works with, a, uh, with less uh, amount of data. So the same algorithms, if you apply to the less amount of data, might not give you an accurate uh, result. Uh, so there are different ways, uh, but uh, what you have to do, you have to experiment uh, multiple algorithms and then you check the performance of each and every one. And based on that, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, choose uh, the optimal algorithms that can be fit to that particular project. Uh, 
but it's hard to decide. But you know from the beginning the kind of questions will lead to what kind of uh, approach that you can uh, take, let's say, either classification uh, sort of analysis or uh, or clustering sort of analytics. So in uh, each one of them has a set of algorithms. Uh, so what do you do? You uh, check those criteria. I haven't uh, really uh, uh, collected those uh, criteria in one uh, slides, but there are many ways to check. As I said, the data set can be, and the nature of the data set also can decide on the type of algorithms you use. Uh, and uh, the second thing that you have to just rely on is uh, you hypothesize your, your, your assumptions. You just pick an algorithm that you assume it gives you a better result. And then you apply, then you compare between those algorithms to see which one has a good result. Uh, I think that's the common uh, practice that normally when we start, we, we just do. We experiment multiple algorithms based on our own assumptions, and then, then we compare between them. Uh, we check the performance, and then we decide on which one. This is if you are looking at the problems from data set uh, point of view, but if you are picking specific algorithms and you are trying to enhance that algorithms, uh, especially those in computer science, then that's a different story. It means you are just working on one algorithm, you are trying to enhance that algorithm but based on the previous studies. Uh, the highest accuracy we have gotten from this result on a part, on particular data set is let's say 90, 90%, and you, uh, you want to enhance that uh, result, then uh, you have to find ways to somehow uh, create, uh, develop uh, a new version of that algorithms with uh, some set of uh, enhancement uh, parameters that can lead to uh, better, better accuracy compared to the existing. So it depends. If the data set, then it's hard to decide on which one, but you can use assumptions and you, you compare between them based on their performance and then you pick the, the optimal one. Uh, so if you are working on a specific algorithms, then you just have to pick that algorithms and enhance based on the previous studies. Okay, so uh, one of them asking about the state of open source uh, for machine learning, actually, uh, R is, uh, if you are talking about the programming language, Python and R is very rich. Uh, Python is a general purpose programming language and it's embedded multiple uh, libraries uh, on it, machine learning algorithms. It's purely for analytics. Uh, those algorithms, you can make use of it. R also is a, it's a, is uh, is more into statistical analysis and has all the kind of algorithms that you need, and you can build your own uh, package and embed it into R also, and you can just make use of it. Uh, the common, uh, if you are working on stream data, you can use Spark also has uh, machine learning capability, and also you can use uh, uh, if you are using Hadoop by yourself, let's say for big data, you can use uh, uh, Hadoop, uh, Hadoop. There is a module uh, they call uh, machine uh, MLAP, something like this. I forgot the name of the model, but you can use that model with Hadoop and MapReduce also to process your, your data using those uh, algorithms, machine learning algorithms. So those are all open source, uh, software you can make use of it but programming site you can just use r python i think it's good enough to to implement any sort of algorithms to in your analysis okay uh i think i have one more uh, question doctor yes uh can you explain about the role of uh feature selection uh, in order to deal with the unstructured data? Okay. Um, actually, when it comes to unstructured data, because uh, mostly sometimes you get a text uh, data. So uh, there are different methods. Uh, they use one of them is a back of words. Uh, 
you have to first clean your data as uh, as we can uh, see sometimes when you collect data from social media the data doesn't uh, comes clean you have to remove some uh, attributes that is not uh, important and also you need to remove some of the uh, the sample the text uh, from the data to leave only the text uh, pure text uh, cleaning so then you can apply some uh, techniques like uh, back of word is uh, one of the common uh, methods that they use to to label your your data and then you can uh, use those label means you just convert it into values uh, uh, into binary zero and one and then you make use of it okay thank you for your answer. is there any other question okay uh, if there is no more uh, question from the from participants I want I want to thank again. Okay, there is question from Encik uh, Nordin. Uh, can you share about the use of machine learning uh, for network performance? Uh, okay. it's uh, actually this is a very uh, huge uh, topic. Uh, I think you can we can discuss this uh, offline. Uh, because this is uh, involved uh, anomaly detection uh, techniques, I can share with you some of the resources that can uh, benefit uh, you. I will share the slides. My email is there, so you can uh, you can email me, and then we can have a chat on this uh, topic: machine learning for network performance. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Then. Okay, if there is no more question, I would like to thank again to Dr. Ibrahim for your very informative uh, lecture and uh, also to everyone for joining us today. And I hope uh, this lecture will be beneficial um, to everyone. So, thank you. Um, you Thank very you very much. much for joining this, and uh, I hope I can uh, provide uh, another session uh, soon. <laughs> yeah, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Thank bye you bye. very much. Yeah. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Thanks.